Can you all see my shirt at the back? <laughs> Excellent, cool, we'll begin. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to talk about big data today. Uh, I'll start there. What I'm going to spend time talking about is data science and a little bit about behavioural psychology as well. Understanding why consumers behave the way they do, especially online, especially the online consumer. Um, but let's start off with data science. Uh, so data science for me is this emergent new field that's uh, started popping up over the last couple of years, which is bringing together computer science and mathematics. Um, so there's a, a new type of person, a new type of role that's popping up in organisations, the, the data scientist, someone who's usually come from a, a mathematical modelling background, who's taken those skills, has a deep understanding of the, the business and the commercials of the business that they're working within, uh, and analyzes that data using increasingly sophisticated techniques to get insight. And big data is when you're looking at very large data sets in doing so. But the bit I'm going to be talking about is how we've just taken those, those techniques from data science, so mathematics and computer science, and use that to get insights on our customer base that helped us to drive growth. But first introductions. Uh, so yes, I'm uh, the Lamb Pyrrhus. That's my, my Twitter handle. Drop me a line if you've got any questions uh, during or after the presentation. I'm the Chief Marketing Technology Officer at Holiday Extras, which means I'm responsible for uh, the B2C business. I describe us as a, a 30-year-old startup. So we've been in business for, for, for 30 years, which is before there was an internet, which is still really hard for me to get my, my head around. Uh, we turned over 200 million last year, uh, and we're a, a relatively high growth business. Um, it's a bit of a thumbnail on the business because that will help you understand a bit more of the, the context I'm going to go through here. Uh, we started off uh, selling into travel agents on the high street, people like Thomas Cook and Thompson, uh, hotels, uh, car parks near airports and travel insurance. Uh, that was so successful that we, we ended up building up a network of most of the UK travel agents and travel agents across Europe during that. Uh, then we moved into other channels. So if you go to easyjet.com, Ryanair, or British Airways, uh, we're there as uh, we power, jet, power EasyJet's extras page. Uh, we do the manage my booking emails you get from, from British Airways, offering you uh, extras around your, your holiday. Uh, we launched our, our business in, in Germany, uh, in Europe actually, 10 years ago, and we've moved into short breaks as well. The vision for the business is uh, we believe holidays should be hassle-free. And what we've tried to do is invest in unique, hard-to-copy technology that helps that ha make that happen. There are 32 million outbound holidaymakers out of the UK. What we try to do is understand as much as possible about each of those individuals and, help, and, then, help, and then sell them products that help them holiday hassle-free. So the, the way I describe that is what we're building is the, is the most efficient way of monetizing trips on the internet. So that's a, that's a big data problem. How do we do that? Well, it's really about taking elements of your customer base, taking elements of the customer data that you have, we explode that out uh, uh, into, into as much detail and granularity as possible. So when somebody comes to our website, we ask them to, to log in with Facebook now, and we ask them, where are you flying away on holiday? Uh, and based on the fact, uh, Andrew, say, uh, you uh, live in London? Just outside London, say, and you're flying out, and you, you're flying out to Chamonix, say, for two weeks. Our algorithms will run, and they'll recommend back to you four products to help you holiday hassle-free. So that's probably going to be ski hire, uh, travel insurance that's bespoke for your for your trip. Uh, we might sell you uh, parking near the airport and uh, something like a, a ski pass as well. So that's basically it. So really, to, to drive that engine forward, we need to manage what I call, we need to own what I call the travel graph, the connection between customers, trips, and the products they need. Okay. Oh, we're recruiting as well. My HR director. Maybe put that one in there. <laughs> okay, back to data science-driven growth. So what I'm going to go now is, is step you through three examples of how we've we've used data science to drive growth over the last three years. Uh, the first one is speed. I mean, and by speed, I mean site speed. Why speed? Um, well, every 100 milli... Well, Amazon released this study a couple of years ago that said every 100 milliseconds, that's one-tenth of a second of an increase in page load time 
leads to a 1% reduction in conversion rate. So I didn't believe this when I read this. I was like, that's bullshit. Uh, but we tested it. So we ran a split test on our homepage where we had one version of our homepage which was exactly as it, as it is. And then we ran 50% of traffic going to a, a different version with a 100 millisecond wait timer that the customer has to wait there for 100 milliseconds and then the page would load. And we saw conversion go backwards by 1%. <laughs> it's like, whoa, that's right. And what's fascinating is as you increase the weight, the conversion goes backwards further and further and further. Our business, like many travel businesses, have, um, have a very long, had, a, had a very long wait time. When you punched in your details for the dates you were looking for for a hotel room and you click the search button, it used to take 14 seconds for the results to come back. So we very quickly set ourselves the objective of going from 14 seconds to sub-second within a year. Challenge. Challenge I gave myself because I was, I was also CTO on the, on the board at the time. So the theme I'm going to talk through here, tying back to, back to data science, is to get to, to insight, to figure out where the issue is, where the bottleneck is in your infrastructure. It's all about slicing the data through as many dimensions as possible till you find the dimension that gives you insight that you can take action on that drives growth. So what you can see here is the output of a tool called New Relic that we installed on our, on our web servers, which gives you, a, and this really does work out of the box, a very quick, high-level view of where the uh, page load times are, where the latency is in your infrastructure. So you can see running along the bottom here, uh, so, so running along the, the, the graph that's here shows you uh, in terms of page load time where, where the time's been spent in the web application layer, in the networking layer, in the DOM being processed, and in the page rendering. You can also see a view in the bottom left-hand corner of page load time by location around the world. That's another dimension. And a third dimension is by which specific page, which you can see in the bottom right-hand side. Slicing through those different dimensions, we quickly understood where the, where the most significant issues were, and we were able to focus on them and fix them, kind of like a, a process optimization problem. And that worked. That took us down to about five seconds. But to really get it to go any further than that, we need to do something a little bit more sophisticated, which is this. So this is the, an output of a tool called R. R is the uh, de facto tool for data scientists. It's kind of a bit like a programming language. It's open source, but the big thing it enables you to do is to load a data set into it and slice it by many dimensions very quickly on graphs so you can understand what the data looks like. So what this shows here is page load time. So that's the, the axis there. That's going up in milliseconds. So that's one second, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, five seconds, going up the, the y-axis. Running along the bottom, we've got different browsers. So you have Chrome, then Firefox, Firefox 3.5, 3.6, the Google bot. That's when Google calls our website. IE6, 7, 8, and 9. Now, we, we got this data from our combination of our server logs and a, and a bit of JavaScript tracking we had on the website. Uh, this type of graph is called a, a box and whisker plot. Uh, so the way to look at it and to read it is uh, if you look at this big bar here, just about here, that says on, on IE7 we have an average load time of just under two seconds. And between the top and the bottom of the bar are half of your users. Okay? So if you compare that, say, to Firefox all the way over here, you've got everyone, almost everyone, having a sub-second experience. And going over there and looking at, say, IE6, you see you have this massive range of experiences but almost everybody taking more than a second. So we never had a report lying around in our IT team, which was, what is the, what's the uh, page download time by, by browser? So it's awesome. You, you go to these conferences, you see these software vendors that say, what you need to do is install our software, and it'll tell you exactly where your problem is. <laughs> you need, we, needed to slu we need to have somebody intelligent, employ somebody intelligent, who understood our business, who understood our technology who could slice the data by multiple dimensions till they found something interesting in the data, which then prompted a conversation with the development team, like, why is IE6 running so slow? Which enabled the guys to figure out there was an issue with, uh, with how we're using JavaScript on the web page and how, Java, how the JavaScript engine on IE6 works, which we could fix that helped move us forward. 
So the point here was to get to, to get to innovation, to get to insight, almost always you're not using a standard form of reporting. Almost always there isn't a standard process around it. It's much more about liberating a, a, a data scientist, somebody who, who's, who you've tooled up and given access to the data, given, plug them into the parts of the business so they know what's important today and help them get to insight and then put the team around them to drive action. Example number two I'm going to walk through is matching products to customers. So the internet for me is all about arbitrage. So you've kind of got customers at one end, uh, at the end of a browser, and you have uh, websites who, have, who are selling products over here. And the businesses that win online for me are the ones that understand as much as possible about their customers, as much as possible about the, the search terms they've typed into Google before they've ended up on your website to figure out which product should they sell to that customer. So I think all web businesses are in the business of matching products to customers. And it's amazing for me how little time and effort they put into solving that problem. Because the better you do that, the more efficient your marketing spend is, and the better your conversion rate is, and the more likely you are to win. For us, this is the kind of information we typically get from our, from our customer, uh, details of their holidays, plus their, a Facebook login, if we're lucky. And we're trying to build the most efficient way of monetizing trip data on the internet. So for us, it's, what I'm going to talk you through is how did we figure out which products to, to return back to which customers. So now I'm not going to talk so much about tools for an analyzing data. I'm going to talk about algorithms. So the first kind of way of, of solving this problem is recommendation. That's what, when, when you talk about this, this is a recommendation problem. And recommendation is, has been solved, hasn't it? There's loads of, uh, I mean, Amazon solved it. Uh, so you go to Amazon's website, you buy something, and you get this great section, which is people who viewed this viewed that. People who bought this bought that. That really doesn't help me when I've got a, someone's holiday details, and I'm trying to figure out what five products to sell them. This is, the, this is the upsell problem. This is really, someone's bought one thing, what else do I sell to them? Uh, what else should I sell to them right now? And absolutely, there is software out there that helps you, you do that, but uh, that wasn't quite the problem we were looking to solve. So rec recommendation isn't what, what we're looking for. The second tool that, that marketeers use out there is segmentation. So this is the, uh, let's divide all our customers up into segments, and let's market to them as a collective. Let's figure out from their demographic information, from the channel that they use, which segment they're in, and based on that, uh, try and build personas against those segments and then push match products against those personas. So that's quite a, quite a common technique as well. The problem with this is that I think consumers are becoming increasingly more demanding around being put into segments that don't match. Marks and Spencer has put me into that segment, so it doesn't always work. Um, and I guess for me, I think, in an era where every single click can be tracked and recorded, we shouldn't be managing customers by guessing what they want and putting them into groups. We should be able to, be, we should be able to manage them on an individual level to personalize their experience. Uh, so we call, that, we call this concept at Holiday Extras personalization, which is grabbing, grabbing this data. So this is, this is where it gets quite interesting. So then it, the next challenge is, uh, we always, we always run into with our team is, well, we don't have that much data on our customers. But when, if you really start looking, you find that you actually have quite a lot, but it's hidden in different parts of the organization. So we had uh, 3.1 million customers last year, uh, of which I think something like one and a half million, million of them actually booked their parking near the airport with us as well. When they did that, they gave us their car registration number. Their car registration number, uh, and when they're checking out, um, we validate the make and model of their car. So we know if you're driving a BMW. We also know, because we get about a 5% uh, response rate on our reviews, so uh, our feedback forms after, after holidays. Uh, so we also know if you liked the products that we sold you. Uh, we also know whether you were traveling with children or not, based on whether or not you took a family room and how many, whether you asked for a cot in the room or not. Uh, we also know where you live based on the postcode you've given us and how far you've had to travel and thought through your end-to-end -end journey for your, for your holiday. And if we start from there, 
when we try to make someone's holiday hassle-free? What can we do to really help them holiday hassle-free? So it's surprising when you, when you start digging, because you can explode all this data out. You can explode out the value. I can go to Parker's and get the valuation of, the, of that BMW, that consumer's driving. I can go uh, to Experian and get the valuation of their, of their house. And through that, you start building up a very rich, detailed picture of that customer, uh, which then helps you figure out, should I lead with selling them the Sofitel, the Hilton, or the Holiday Inn Express? Should I sell them the best family room at Gatwick? Or should I be leading on the, 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 the cheapest night closest to the slopes? Uh, but there's still a very hard tech problem here to figure out which one. So uh, I'm going to walk you through the different types of uh, algorithms we've experimented with over the last couple of years at, at Holiday Extras. The first one's something called a decision tree algorithm. So these ones are pretty commoditized. Um, they uh, easily available in a programming language called Python uh, as libraries and they're used quite a lot by, by mathematicians and physicists uh, to help answer, answer similar kinds of questions. So basically what, what a decision tree algorithm does is it asks, ask, answers a series of yes no questions about your data. So is this customer male or female? Do they live more than 20 miles away from the airport? Are they flying away for more than two weeks? And you keep working your way down the tree and at the bottom of the tree, we map our products back against those, those, that, those sectors of customers. So that was pretty successful for us. That worked pretty well as a first iteration. We measured what the conversion rate was on using that algorithm, but we wanted to try harder. So we, we jumped to the mainstay of data science, which is Bayesian statistics. Picture of Thomas Bayes there. So the way Bayesian statistics works is, given this customer's history, what is the probability that they will buy this product if I push it in front of them? Um, what you start running into there quite quickly is in order to get a large sample size, you're back into pushing customers into groups and marketing to them, marketing to them as a collective again. So that didn't really fit either the, the solution that we were looking for. So we've ended up at the moment with graph databases. Uh, graph databases are part of the... Uh, NoSQL movement, and uh, the one that we're using is Neo4j. And what graph databases do is rather than store your data in rows and columns, uh, they store your data as the connection of relationships. So we have the connections between our different customers mapped, customers with similar attributes, and the connections between different products. And we look at how those overlay with each other, which we call the travel graph, the connections between customers and products and we look at how near different customers are near other customers and which products are overlapping. So that's what we're, we're currently doing there. Other different techniques in this domain are things like machine learning. Uh, and this is quite, quite exciting for me as a former mathematician. It's just rather than one sync, I think we're, we're, in a, we're in an age where, where there is a number of emergent, very, very different techniques to solve these kinds of big data problems out there. Uh, that different kinds of companies are using. Netflix are at one end of the spectrum, Amazon at the other end of the spectrum, and I think the businesses that figure out exactly which, which solving which problem is core to their USP, their competitive advantage, uh, their customer proposition, uh, and align their, their algorithms and their data behind that, they will win. And that's how we do it. The last example I'm going to walk you through is conversion. So conversion is a measure uh, used by e-commerce businesses that measures the number of purchases or customers on a website divided by the number of visitors. So for us at Holiday Extras, we had 3 million customers last year. We had 30 million visitors, so our conversion rate was 10%. We had 200 million clicks on that website last year as well. And like many trading businesses, I come into work on a Monday morning and uh, I get asked the question, why are we up? Why are we down? So this question is really challenging to answer if your visitor numbers are flat, but you've grown uh, bookings for us or bookings have gone backwards. So that means conversion has moved either up or down. And trying to understand why conversion is moving is one of the, one of the hardest things in e-commerce. 
So there's some tools out there for helping you with this. Uh, so this here is called uh, a funnel, a checkout funnel. So at the top we had, uh, say in this example, 1,800 people who went to the shopping cart, of which 853 started filling out their details on the form, of which 479 made it to the confirm page. So the way to optimise the funnel is to see it as a kind of a leaky pipe. You look where you're losing customers the most, at the top up there, and you go and try to understand why are they leaving, where are they going to, and you try to fix it. Then you go on to the next one, and the next one afterwards. Another way of slicing the data, a different dimension to slice the data through, uh, so this is the output of uh, Google Analytics, and it's called their visitor flow view. So what you're doing here is by slicing the data by uh, source country, so you can see here the performance of uh, visitors from Canada versus visitors from the United States or from, from the United Kingdom. And you can see where, different, where they drop off on the site on different pages. So that's also pretty helpful. A third dimension that we sliced it through was to benchmark our performance on each page versus industry benchmarks. So much like many other travel websites, you, you punch in your details, you press search, you get back a list of products. We call that our availability page. We had 15% of customers only making it through that page to the next page. So that's the upgrade page, where we try to upgrade the booking. 98% of customers made it through that page to the payment page. And 43% made it through to confirmation. When we went and benchmarked ourselves against competitors, we found we are doing pretty well on payment, pretty well on upgrades, but availability was pretty, pretty low. So the first question is why? Again, really, really hard to get to the bottom of that question. Uh, for me, getting to, to the bottom of why really means starting to understand the behaviour of your customers on your website. And for me, grabbing behavioural data can be a pretty good insight to help you figure out why customers are behaving the way they do, are doing on your website. Uh, so one way of doing this is through running exit surveys on the website. So when, and you're beginning to see this become more and more prevalent. When you're leaving a website and uh, halfway through uh, a checkout flow, they pop a, pop a form that says, please tell us the reason that you're leaving, what can we do to help? And if you grab that data and you analyse it, which is what we did, uh, we found that 13% of our visitors were leaving because of the quality of the images. They weren't sure what they were buying. 65% were because of the quality of the descriptions and the information, 21% because of the product. Why that's really great is because I've suddenly got a business case for investing in images on my website and for improving the quality of my content. So I hired an editor-in-chief uh, from the Daily Mail group and he spent the last couple of years working his way around all of the products that we sell, taking great quality videos and photography. And that's led to, that was one of the reasons why we managed to grow over the last year as well. So just to summarise uh, the, the process that I've, we've gone through there in every single example. Capture data, so capture data at its lowest atomic level and given the way in which cloud computing is moving, things like S3, uh, it really is for a marginal cost you can do that. Slice the data, so what we do a lot of is investing in our in in the speed with which we can iterate through looking at the data through different dimensions. Once you've sliced it and you've spotted something interesting, you still need somebody who can look at that and figure out what are you going to do about that. And that's someone who's got a deep empathy for your customers and understanding of the commercials of your business. Launch and then repeat the process again. What we try to do is we measure how long it takes for us to go all the way around that circle once. And we're investing in trying to be able to, to accelerate the number of times we can go through that every week. Because I believe that the, more, the faster you do that is the faster you learn and the faster you'll grow. So really, we weren't talking about conversion in that final example. We were much more talking about understanding consumers, understanding what they want, and figuring out how you incentivize the right kind of behavior. Which brings me on just to a final danger I'll highlight, which I, I've spotted over the last couple of years that we seem to treat two very different kinds of problems, and I've walked through two of them here, in exactly the same way. So 
There's, there are engineering problems that we solve every day in our businesses. So the speed problem was an engineering problem. How do you make your website run faster? And you can definitely solve that by uh, crunching the data, figuring out what the single biggest problem is, um, getting clever guys to look at that, fix it, then move on to the next problem, then move on to the next problem, and you will end up with a faster website. Absolutely, that works. The conversion problem is something completely different. Our conversion is 10%. That means 9 out of 10 visitors visit our website and leave. Why? Looking at data and analysing it and applying process to it is not going to tell you the answer. Talking to consumers helps. Trying to under getting, um, building a relationship with the customer helps. But really overlaying behavioural psychology with data to drive action feels like an area that we're only really beginning to, to scratch, the, scratch the service of. And I, I describe this as behavioural causality is a hell of a lot more difficult to understand than, than process causality or, or simpler. Understanding why people do things is really hard. So to summary, to summarise, uh, data is your largest untapped asset. We grew our revenues from 160 million to 200 million over the last three years. Over a period where the market, the number of outbound travel makers, travel, travel makers out of the UK uh, went backwards by about 20%. So during that period, uh, the market shrunk. We grew because we had this asset, which was our data, and that using that data to help us figure out how do we sell more to a declining customer base? How do we get more of those fewer customers to convert better on our websites? That's how we, how we managed to grow. And finally, storing, analyzing, and innovating. Three steps to success. And that's it. <laughs>